shake hands. Hi. Hi. Donald, get a hug. All right. Where are the sunglasses? You, you know, I took off my sunglasses. Um, you know I'm well-known hug hater, but I'll have to like it. So thank you for wearing code colors. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Looks good. Um, I, I brought this for you so it matches. <laughs> Cheryl didn't this like my... This is awesome. Make San Francisco great again. This is the Kara Swisher. Uh, I just got... <laughs> Kara Swisher. That's my motto. She didn't like my... For mayor. governor, for mayor. Yeah. San... Like it? Anyway, um, so you can take it off. Um, Marcus brought <laughs> Do you want it back? <laughs> yeah, Anyone I, want I, it? I just just it off. Yes. No, she can have it. Just throw it out. Throw it out? Ready? Let's see if I can throw it out. I'm good. I didn't need a hat. I know, I know. I'm oh, yeah. It matches um, so you can pass it around. So let's get right into it. Um, let's get right into it. Um, let's talk about current topics. You guys have been in the news quite a bit lately. Which really? one? Yes. We want to start. What do you notice? Do you that. want to start with Teal or Glenn Beck? Which one? Your pick. Wherever you want to start. Tara. All right. Um, Teal. Any comment on his activities? <laughs> he's on your board. This is pertinent because he's a, he's a long, he's the longest board member uh, huh? besides Mark. Uh, Jim Breyer was a board member who's no longer, so he is the longest board member. Any, I can see you like, like, mm. love it. Um, I mean, I know this has been actively discussed here, and it should be actively discussed because issues of independence and the media are key to democracy and key to all of us. It's what you're about, what the conference is about. Peter did what he did on his own, not as a Facebook board member. We didn't know about it. And? And you should talk to him. Okay. Um, I know he might come tomorrow, right? No, no, he was no. Invited? No, he's not even returned our email. Um, he's, <laughs> um, uh, and I don't expect him to. Um, it was a really nice email, too, by the way. And which wasn't is lovely? Please, yeah. come so to our state. Hey, hey, hey. Usually, usually, usually <laughs> my email stuff. But um, he's remaining on the board. There's no, uh, there's no taking him off the board for something like this. I think everyone in this audience wears different hats, and sometimes we do something with the companies we work at. I do most of what I do as a Facebook exec, but I also run Lean In, and I'm the chairman of that sometimes. And you know, he did this, really, it's not a Facebook thing. And we have very independent board members with very independent thoughts that they share publicly. Yes. Those same strong people actually make really good board members because they have strong views, and they're not afraid to think differently than other right. people. And I think that served Facebook very well. Right, in Mark's case, though, with the India situation, Mark wrote, a, the other Mark wrote a letter. Uh, Mark Andreessen, when he did his tweet, actually was speaking, it almost looked like he was speaking for Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so we thought the company needed to comment. This was never, there's been no implication that he was doing this for Facebook. Yeah. So we stayed out of it, we didn't have to comment. Okay, all right, I'll let you off on that. And I'm sure other people should ask questions about it. Um, so um, I'm gonna go with you on the, on the platform. On the platform, yes, you yes. next. Um, did, were you in the meeting with Glenn Beck? I was not. You were not. Nonetheless, you were in charge of the platform, and I will ask you about that too, but you were on the, you run the platform. The argument was this is a platform. We're open to everybody. We're open we to all things. So talk a little bit about that, and then I'd love to understand how you felt during that situation. Well, I mean, the first thing to remember, trending topics is a small corner of the website, and right. really the main news feed, what's in there is driven by what you like, who you friend, and if you, you know, just take a friend of yours with very different political views and look at their mm -hmm. newsfeed, look at your newsfeed. Yeah, I don't have any of those. You're going to see, yeah, you're going to see very different things. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's, and I understand the concern because it's, it's critical that we maintain that where people have uh, control over what they see right. on Facebook. So when, when this was brought up, what did you think as an engineer, you know, you're the top engineer, what did you think? Like, no, this is what? Like, what did you? Well, look. I, we, we run a big site that has a big responsibility. So I think any time something is raised, our first question is, like, what's going on? Is there something to this? Mm -hmm. And so we immediately started digging through to understand, you know, mm -hmm. were there any core issues? And that's where Mark was very public very soon to say, look, so far, as far as we can tell, mm -hmm. you know, no, no systematic bias in, in, in any of this stuff. And so, and furthermore, not only that, but we're like, look, we want to really make sure we have this right. And so we're going to make the, the procedures, policies, the values here even more clear you know, than they were before, just to make sure. Because I think, look, we take these things seriously. We want to make sure we are the platform for people to share. That's what we're here Whoever for. Whoever they, whatever. Sorry. Whatever they do. So can an algorithm have a bias? Because there was a great essay about that. The idea, I'm sure you saw it. The idea of algorithms actually do have biases more than... Well, I think things, you know, if you think about, first of all, again, on, on Facebook, so much of what you see is dominated by who you friend and what you like. And so just try this experiment. Unlike all the pages you have, go like a bunch of very different pages, load your news feed. 
you get something very different. So you don't have to believe me, you can try it for yourself. Um, and so all of these systems are dependent on the data that you provide them. And this is why in our case, we try to, as hard as we can, make sure that the, the things that are controlling what you see on Facebook is dominated by the choices you make as an individual. And those are very different from, from person to person. So uh, cannot cannot have a bias, or it can Well, I think you can train anything to do anything you want. So, you right. know, if you, if you wanted to create something, you know, these things are basically kind of pattern matchers or data detectors, and so you can, you know, if you train it on a, a set of data that um, doesn't account for everything, then it will, you know, be in that way. So I think it really depends how you set this thing up. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why, again, we focus so much on, look. And on trending topics, which I know it's a small part, but it's the one they noticed. It's the I think what you have to understand is the way most of the site is done, there are no human editors. So the question is, is there algorithmic yeah. bias? Right. Most of the data we use for newsfeed comes from you. It's what you like and friend. And actually, the best way to improve your newsfeed is give us more information. On every post, you can hide this post. You can say, see first, I want to see more from this person or this publisher. Mm -hmm. You can say less mm -hmm. or not at all. And so giving us information improves your newsfeed and makes it as relevant for you. And again, as Shrep said, you look at two different people's newsfeed, you see dramatically different things. With trending topics, it was a small, it's a small part of the site. We had an editorial team, mm -hmm. and so there was real concern. And people believe Silicon Valley has a liberal bias, so we mm -hmm. understood the concern, mm -hmm. which is why it's so important the steps we're taking to make the process we're using for that editorial more transparent so people can see them. And also to sit down face to face with the people who had the concerns and listen to what they had to say. So talk to me about that meeting. I know you don't want to talk about everything that happened in the meeting, but does Silicon Valley have a liberal bias? I mean, that was their question. So I think that wasn't their question. What they wanted to understand is all of them are public voices and they are using our platform to distribute their ideas. They're using our platform to share what they want to say and they want to make sure that our platform is open to all ideas. So explaining how newsfeed works, how trending topics works, what we care about really matters. I think sharing the numbers really matters. Donald Trump has more followers than Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton combined. Mm -hmm. That's an accurate reflection of what they're doing on the platform. Probably the most interesting part of the meeting was when people in the meeting shared with each other, here's what I'm doing on Facebook that's working. Here's how Facebook's helping me reach more mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, the most important thing. What did I, they want from you? What did they want? More training of employees to be more conservative or what? What was the... Well, as you saw, <laughs> as you saw in some of their reporting, and I'll let them speak for themselves, they want different things. But what all of them want is to understand that we are an open platform for all ideas, that we're not biasing and pushing some stories because of a liberal point of view or because of a conservative point of view and to understand how to use the platform for their ideas. So like all journalists, when they're writing things, when they have ideas, they want to reach as many people as possible. And that way we're aligned. We want them to reach mm -hmm. the people who want to hear from them. That's really important because your newsfeed is only as good as the content in it. Mm -hmm. And for people who never want to miss an article you publish or don't want to miss any of this conference being live streamed on Facebook, we want them to have that experience. Mm -hmm. And when they, uh, and I'm going to finish up with this, but getting back to the Silicon Valley bias, now you're a prominent, you, you post all the time on Facebook about Hillary, Peter Thiel is a Trump, uh, will be probably, mm -hmm. as Trump delegate. Um, were they concerned with that, like the idea that Silicon, because you know, you're very prominent, support a Democrat. Um, is that something that you had to address with them or should have to address with them at all? I think they need to know that we are separate as individuals as we are. That wasn't something that came up in the meeting. They mm -hmm. really wanted to understand how Facebook works, how the algorithms work, how the trending topic editorial team works, so they can mm -hmm. understand that the platform mm -hmm. was I also think, and they wrote this, that they, they said that they found Mark and all of us really open to the dialogue, mm -hmm. that we were happy to have them come. We were grateful they all came on short notice, and we want the continuing dialogue on what, what they think makes the platform work for them. So should there be training within companies overall to be more tolerant on all sides? I mean, always. We've done this broadly. We care a lot about diversity. Our industry is not where it needs to be. We know we're not where it needs to be. We have an unconscious bias class that mm -hmm. every, not everyone, we haven't made it mandatory, but most people in the company have taken it. The entire leadership team mm -hmm. has taken it. We're really proud of that. And we put it online open so anyone who wants to use it for their company or their individual purposes can. And yeah, we all have biases. I mean, I talk a lot about them with regards to women. Strong biases exist with regards to race. I think understanding what those are is the only way we're going to get to more diversity in our companies, for example. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the reason people are so concerned about Facebook on lots of levels is because of the power of Facebook. 
Um, publishers, you know, are relying on it for distribution. Uh, I think between Snapchat and you, those are the two places people are looking. How do you look at, do you think, you know, you've sort of become a Google-ish in a lot of ways in terms of where people need to be. Talk a little bit about that. How do you look at your platform? I know you're all like, oh, we're just a platform, we're just open, anyone can come, but you have enormous power well, I mean, uh, over. I think, yeah, can we talk about the job swap? Our job swap? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, so this, is, this was, okay. you know, cause, cause, so we, we so swapped jobs. that was jobs. when Facebook went down that day? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it wasn't Cheryl that day might have, for the you record. Know, had, right. pushed a bug or two, but. She pushes we, a bug, what's this? What's <laughs> this? <laughs> Space is not tabs, but, right. um, okay. so, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, okay, I totally didn't get that, but I'm sure it was funny. Silicon Valley, It was Come very on, funny, people laughed. No, oh, right, oh, oh, you oh, loved oh, it. Right, yes, yes. The only thing that, the only problem is he's just wrong. Right. He's just wrong, that's the only problem with that episode. Okay, okay, all right. The, uh, it's definitely spaces. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> the. <laughs> There's disagreement on that. Yeah. Right, right uh, here. There's gonna be the most controversial. We're gonna go to Beyond Emacs for all the geeks in the room. But um, okay. so uh, we swapped jobs and uh, for three days. For three days, um, the company mostly survived. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting for me, and, I, and you can talk about what you, what you found, is like. I mean, I was just running Cheryl's schedule, going from meeting to meeting, where all she's trying to do is figure out how to help our partners and mm -hmm. publishers. Mm -hmm. And if this can be free to lay, it can be a policy meeting, it can be a, a you know a publisher, and trying to make sure that you know this idea that Facebook is this huge distribution platform, and we want to make sure it works as best as it can for everyone, mm -hmm. is at least in the little experience I had where Cheryl spends a lot of her day. Mm -hmm. And you. What was so interesting for me is, other than how good Shrep actually is at selling ads, which I told him he's <laughs> welcome to do any time, yeah. is actually I think the time frame for decision making is actually different on the different sides of the company. So we run the company with a three, five, and 10 year plan. The three year plan is our current business, our current platform, Facebook, user growth, engagement, monetization. In the next five years, our newer services, you know, from WhatsApp to Messenger to search to groups to video, making those big and important, getting to a billion users and active users and monetization of those. And on the 10 year time frame, it's really core technology investments mm -hmm. that pay off over longer periods of time. And while certainly both of us do both the longer and the shorter things, more of my team's time is focused within the three to five years. We are working on Facebook, on engagement, on publishers, on their distribution, mm -hmm. on advertisers and our clients and on running the company. And a lot of the longer term investments I don't make a lot of decisions on a daily basis other than investment levels, which I make with Mark and Wiener, which have those longer term mm -hmm. time horizons. Whereas Shrep's job is more about those core technology investments that we're making over 10 years. All right, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but let's get back to the power thing. Um, do you feel that Facebook has, wait, you know, you worked at Google, you know the nervousness around that. Again, publishers are nervous, lots of people that are participate in the, in the ecosystem are worried. Do you address that? Like, we have to take that responsibility really seriously. Anyone who puts out any product or service has a responsibility to the people that use that product or service. You know, if that's a car, it needs to be safe. If that's a consumer product, it needs to be safe and safe and comply with health standards. For us, we help people share and we help, we have a platform that gives people voice and that means it has to be open to all voices. That means we can't favor one publisher over another. That means people who want to read your articles need to get it on our platform, and people who want to read Walt, and people who want to read other people need to get it on our platform. So we take that incredibly seriously, and certainly as we grow, we have a bigger responsibility. I think what we like the best are some of the ways people are using the platform. So every member of Congress now has a Facebook page, and increasingly they're using Instagram. Some of them are posting about every vote they make. We love that. Open, transparent, accountable to people but who But if you were a publisher, you. how would you feel about Facebook? If I was a publisher... You, you, and you thought about going to a publisher. You did. <laughs> but it, many, when you were doing the job change many, many years ago, you thought about it. I would want to make sure that Facebook was open to all ideas, and that's what we do. We sit down with our publishers. We have an open platform. We show them how to use it. We really want journalists to publish to Facebook. We've done things with instant articles to make the process much faster. We're seeing more engagement, more people reading more content with more, with more sharing and more commenting. But what would you be we nervous also about with a company like Facebook? I think if I were a publisher, what I'd be nervous about is that the old methods of distribution and monetization are changing. Mm -hmm. And Facebook's only one part of that, but that's why we take our responsibility to help publishers distribute their content and also help them think about monetization really seriously. 
All right, let's get to the platform itself, again, using the platform. Talk about where, we're going to talk about advertising, VR, yeah. AI. Good. Um, OK, I know you like that. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about that. I still so. think you're still a little more scary than you think. I remember years ago at Google saying, oh, we're not scary at all. I'm like, you're terrifying. And they never, ever thought of themselves as terrifying. And I think Facebook is the same way, as we're your friendly publisher. But then I'm like, but you could kill me at any moment. Um, no, I, I think I we think take we, this pretty we seriously. We take this seriously. I mean, do we want to talk about the people versus users? I mean, so it's sometimes it's these little things, and this is where I think Mark is particularly surprising. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, he went through, most companies talk about users. You know, mm -hmm. that's how they talk about the people using their service. Mm -hmm. Mark's like, look, we want to talk about this as the people we are serving. They're using our products, but that we are providing a service for them. We need to treat them like an equal, not like, and, and so he actually made us go rename everything, all of our metrics, instead of monthly active users, monthly active people, and working on the language, you know, at that level of detail to say, Look, this is something that we're doing, and we have a responsibility to serve the people who are um, on these products as, as best as we can. Okay. And so I can't say we're perfect about it, and, but it's not like we don't spend every day realizing that this is a really important thing that we need to do the very best we are capable of. of so helping let's people. first talk about advertising. We changing drastically. I know that, but it's changing drastically and worrisome for lots of people, like where it's going. What do you, where do you think the future of where advertising is going? And you can talk about Snapchat or any other, not just Facebook yeah. ads. I mean, I think the future of advertising is that businesses know they need to reach people where they are, and that's on mobile phones. So three years ago, the lines crossed for the first time, and now the average U.S. citizen spends four hours on TV a day and five and three quarter hours on digital, the majority of which is mobile, and mobile's driving that growth. So the question is, if you're trying to reach people, where do you go? And increasingly, you have to go to the soft screen of a mobile phone. We invested really hard in that transition, and I think at this point, Facebook and Instagram have the most important mobile ad platforms, and that's because we can reach people where they are. It's in a feed context, so people are engaged with it. And we've really worked hard on our ad formats and our relevancy and targeting. And so what we offer is the opportunity to do the big, broad, mass reach that you can traditionally get with TV and still get with TV mm -hmm. and targeting. I'll share an example. So we have Facebook in the US on mobile. We have a Super Bowl every day. So one recent example is Toyota with Saatchi LA. They did a campaign for the RAV4 hybrid, a new hot hybrid they put out. In three days, they reached 36 million people with a broad video, just your basic <laughs> brand video you kind of put on TV. And then what they did is they retargeted all the people who actually watched the video with 500 different, different personalized videos, which were optimized for Facebook and, and Instagram. And using our targeting, we got to 500 different demographic and likes and interest groups so that the ad you saw was relevant for you and it would be different than Can tracks. anyone else compete with this? Well, I think there's a huge shift going on. So one of the core advantages we have is how much mobile time we get from people. Right, that's on the phone. Said. Can anyone else? Yeah, we get, we get more than one in five minutes between Facebook and Instagram, but people are spending the other 80%, you know, other places. And I think what matters is that we, all of us, work to get the right ad to the right person at the right time. Because when ads are good, when they're for something you want to see, here's the interview coming up mm -hmm. at the Code Conference. You know, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates are going to be on the stage, and you want to see that, you're psyched. Mm -hmm. And when ads are non-targeted, you're not, and they're annoying. And so we really work hard mm -hmm. on the targeting, and we're excited about what we're doing. That said, even with our largest clients, we do not get the fraction of the time the consumers spend with us. Their spend is still really much, much more heavily based, in, certainly in terms of time spent in the old media forms. And while they need to continue doing that, we never tell anyone to advertise only with us, I think that shift to mobile, consumers are moving faster than businesses. Yeah. And so businesses still need to catch up. Okay. So, Shrep, talk a little about the next platforms. Where are you, what do you look at when, if you're in this longer time frame? What, right, what is Facebook's next yeah. thing it's going to try to egregiously dominate? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, ask next thing we're going to invest in. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. And compete. I need Sheryl you know, Sandberg lessons. Market. <laughs> I need Sheryl Sandberg There we lessons. go. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's cool is we've talked so publicly about our 10-year roadmap. I mean, right. Mark, Mark and I talked about it at the F8 conference, and we said, look, over the next 10 years, there's, there's three things we're focusing on. Getting the 4 billion people who aren't on the internet on the internet, you know, building AI so that we can all deal with the massive information out there and break down any barriers people have to communicating, and then building VR and, and AR technologies to allow us to have you know, rich social experiences with people even if we're hundreds or thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of, those three things are where we're spending So talk about AR and energy. VR, because that's the furthest out, yeah. although you're introducing... VR is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Same thing. Okay, all right, and? And? 
No, it's, um, you know, I, I remember when we first, um, uh, first started looking at, at VR and, and we saw the first demos. And I mean, these things, you know, a few years ago were, were just look like a pair of ski goggles with duct tape and a mm -hmm. cell phone screen, you know, jammed mm -hmm. into it. And it's hooked up to a PC and you're kind of looking around the thing. Now they look like thing. goggles with something. Very beautiful. For, for beautiful versions. But beautiful, still not. Um, but, uh, hey, come out with me on Saturday night. <laughs> but all right. but, but the, the thing that was interesting is you kind of had this experience and it was a solitary experience and I think people really saw the application for gaming right away. It's right. like, okay, great, this is a really great gaming device. But what's mm -hmm. really interesting is taking that and saying, okay, we're about connecting people and, and social, so what, what does Facebook and VR mean? And, and thinking through, okay, this thing is the closest thing we're gonna get to, to a teleporter, to the ability for me to feel like I'm at a place with someone else, right. even though we can't physically be in the same location, sure. family members or others. And it, you know, what's surprising is it took us another year of development until we had the, the touch controllers mm -hmm. and a demo we called Toy Box, where you have two people kind of playing in this little room. Mm -hmm. And then you know, a little bit later when I demoed something in F8 where I was on stage and someone else is 35 miles away and we we're kind of touring around. And so it's, it's one of these things that's hard to describe until you try it, but mm -hmm. when you have these moments of you know, these vivid memories I have of being in VR with another person, mm -hmm. and you're like, this is a technology that's, that's, that I think gonna erase geographic boundaries for people. For more than two people now that you've gotten it oh, yeah. one Oh yeah, no, person. you can do more than two. You can do, we've done groups of people. You know, our, the, the team that's building some of these experiences does their Friday afternoon meetings in VR. Mm -hmm. So they all get together in, in VR and they do it in VR. <clears throat> and, and where so, do they do it, in like Sri Lanka? Or <laughs> you know, we could probably spruce up the room they're in. You know, right. it's a pretty boring little 3D room, right. but you know, it's a, uh, you know, that is already a better experience. So than, the than application for Facebook, well, you can think of lots of other ones, would be getting together, showing baby pictures, showing the baby, yeah. whatever, that kind of thing. Or anything. anything. I mean, it's really about empathy. Mm -hmm. So there was this great uh, VR film done, Clouds Over Sidra, which actually walked through a Syrian refugee girl's experience. We all know we have a huge refugee crisis, but mm -hmm. to be able to experience it in that kind of environment and feel it a little bit more. At the end of the day, Facebook, is about people connecting. Our mission is to give people the power to share. Mm -hmm. And anything that makes that sharing more real, gives us more empathy towards each other, is something we're for. So the, to the, when you talk about the key things, I, I agree with that. If it, if it gets developed and gets given out to enough people and it's easy to use, right now it's expensive. It's it will, I mean, this is why it's a 10 year thing. Look, yeah. I think that people are maybe, you know, it took 10 years for cell phone, smartphones mm -hmm. to get to a billion, billion people. So I think the key thing is there's no reason this can't get there, but it, it will take time. You know, you, people have to have patience. Does something have to happen in the way it's presented? Because it's still a cumbersome experience. I think you'll see, you know, iterative development on this. You know, mm -hmm. the headsets will get, they'll get easier to put on, they'll get smaller and lighter, the resolution will get better, the content will get better. I mean, this takes years of iteration. And that's why, you know, for us, when we say 10 years, what we mean is we're gonna be patient about it even when everyone else decided it was a fad mm -hmm. and they decided they're not interested. Well, now they're all in. We're gonna keep going. Right, now they're all in. Because that will happen. This is how these cycles go. Right. Um, but w we do think it is a transformational technology. for the, And it is, you know, Cheryl's point, it's like the ultimate empathy device. You right. wanna really know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. I don't know of another technology in the time horizon where I'm gonna be alive that is like this. So what are you you're working on VR? Yeah. AR? which will help people. You're not making a Google Glass like <laughs> act thing, are you? You just laughed at me. <laughs> no, I mean, we're, no. we're, we're looking- making a Google Glass like device? We're, we're looking, I mean, AR is an interesting uh, concept too. I don't think the technology is there yet. Because? I mean, it's, there are many uninvented technologies in making something that's lightweight, is you know cosmetically acceptable for people in a real world, which is where you are, um, and has the right kind of display fidelity that you'd want to, to make that work. But there's a lot of interesting technology to build there, and so we're, we're building that technology to try to get there. To try and we're to working at AI, and we're working on AI. AI, and that's yes, exactly. really important. Let's talk about that finally. Yeah, I mean AI is another. I mean, you know, Bill Gates talked about it earlier today, and, and others. It's um, it's you know, for us, it's another one of these transformational technologies, especially for connecting people. You know, it's 800 million people a, a month are seeing posts translated. So if you have a friend or family member who speaks a different language, we can translate it. There's you know. Um, hundreds of millions of people with visual disabilities, and we can, for the two billion photos that are uploaded on Facebook, we can automatically generate captions for, for every one of those, for anyone who may need it. And we just talked yesterday about how, you know, a challenge with all of this content is making sure the right stuff is on the platform and, and none of the stuff that violates the community standards. And, you know, it turns out our AI systems are now reporting more of that content than all of the people on Facebook are. Are you nervous about these pro We're asking this of everybody. Is it something that you think about of where it goes? Well, I mean, it's change, right? And technology has changed. And so I understand why, you know, there's, there's people are nervous about it. But, you know, the power of AI to 
improve healthcare, to you know, make every doctor in the world with the power of computer vision you know, as good as the world's best dermatologist or radiologist? You know, do you, do you want to make sure the doctor you see is the absolute best or like pretty good? I want a computer to diagnose everything. Yeah, so, so I mean, it just has the power. It can, it's going to stop 70,000 car accidents in the U.S. when auto braking is on, you know, every, every car, which will happen, you know, in, in, in a few decades. Um, and then, you know, on Facebook, it's not only preventing the bad content, it's translating things. It's if there's any barrier between you communicating different language, you know, uh, any disability, like AI can erase that. That's the happy vision of it. Or, or thinking about, you know, diagnosing skin melanoma, right? With AI, anywhere in the world, you can have the equivalent diagnosis of the very best person at Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and so yes. I think every technology presents challenges. Of course, there are things to be worried about. We have a responsibility, any of us who are developing it. But we live, we all live longer, healthier, better lives because of technology, and we believe in that progress. All right, Cheryl Sandberg. I have one more quick question about that. You've been, I, on Facebook, they keep popping up these old pictures, which makes me feel super old. Me and too. I sent one, well, no, interesting. I sent one of you eight years ago. On this Mark, stage. On, on this, not this stage, but nearby, um, with Mark. When you started the job, when you started the job, and I think I sent, oh my God, we're so fucking old, and you said, no, I'm young. Um, but um, Speak for yourself. <laughs> you look good. Um, why are you, you've both been there eight years. Some yeah. people wonder if you can like keep the team, the team seems to be doing rather well, but is there a point where you want to leave? I mean, like there was, we it love was too raised. Much fun. All right. I, like I mean, there was I a point raised that you could be the CEO of Disney. Did you want to be the CEO of Disney? I love my job. Mark and I gave I our first ever public interview on yeah. not the stage, but your stage. And you know, Mark had a vision and a mission for what it is to be connect the world. We had 70 million users. Today we have 1.65 billion. We have an incredible team, an incredibly close team. We're all really good friends. The product has a way of changing us as well. And so I get to work with my closest friends, with Shrep and Chris and Mark, on something I really believe in. But can you Pretty stay sharp together as a group, or is there a point where... I think you can if you continue to challenge yourself and you continue to bring in new people and you continue to realize that you have to execute. I mean, We've done well on the mobile transition, but there's another platform coming. We try really hard to make sure our product's just as engaging. We know we need to keep iterating everything from what users do to advertisers do to what our partners do. We know we have a big responsibility in the world, and so the challenges are real, but the opportunity is So you is don't vast. want another job? I don't. I work you don't with want to my run best for office? friends. Do you I don't want another job. And you don't want to run? You're not I don't run. want to run for office. I don't want another job. I love Facebook and my team. Okay. I'm right. good too, Kara. Okay, good. <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> you know, she just gets speculated all about a lot. Oh, I know. Sorry. I know. Yeah, I never see uh, you. Do in... you want me to step I... out? No, that's okay. I never see you in the gossip columns. It's fascinating. <laughs> that's great. Well, you know, I sit let's, next let's keep to it Shrep, that way. Okay. and he's, he does have those goggles on a lot. You does get he? used to it. Yeah. Okay. You get kind of used to sitting yeah. next to that. Yeah. 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 That's why you're not in the gossip. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, questions from the audience? Josh? Uh, hi. Uh, Josh Topolsky, Independent Media. Um, so I want to be really clear on, why are these always so low? Can you get these for tall people? <laughs> no. Can you guys yeah. not afford the tall mics? Um, your position on Peter Thiel, I just want to be crystal clear. Um, Peter Thiel, in secret, was is systematically trying to destroy one of the toughest critics of Facebook and Peter Thiel and a lot of other people in Silicon Valley. And that doesn't strike you as a problem for somebody who sits on your board. Because we don't know, just to be clear, he may be trying to systematically destroy lots of media entities or journalists that are critical of him or people that he knows or critical of Facebook. And that doesn't present a challenge for you when you think about the kinds of people you want sitting on your board, the kinds of people that would represent a company that's supposed to be a platform for everybody to speak. Doesn't that seem strange? I, I just... There, look, there are, these, are, these are hard issues and no one's going to pretend when independent board members do anything, it's easy for the companies and the boards they sit. We're not going to pretend that. You know, but we want to be clear that Peter did what he did as an independent person. He didn't do it at Facebook. We didn't know. And he didn't use any Facebook resources. Now, what Gawker should get from us, and they do get from us, is the same distribution anyone else gets. They're a partner. They're in our beta program for monetization of live video. And so if he did anything with Facebook resources, that would be a Facebook issue. And I understand there are complicated, complicated issues here, but this was something done independently with no, with no Facebook resources. But you know now 
We that, do know. And, and if he were doing it to other businesses, that still wouldn't change your opinion? I mean, it's really hard to answer all of these hypotheticals, right. but what really matters is we are an open platform and Gawker's getting distribution from us, as is the New York Times, as is Fox News, as is Rico. So we will right. remain on the board, just to be clear. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, Zach Kaplan, General Atlantic. Uh, you mentioned, and a lot of people have cited data around the shifting consumption from television and old media to digital and to mobile, yet if you actually look at the television advertising market, it's been pretty stable for many, many years in a row. So the question is, what has to change for that to really crack and come over to digital? Is it still better ad products and formats? Is it different user experiences like Facebook Live? Like, what has to change, or is it just natural progression of Or time? is it the people who are running it's, these systems? Well, first of all, people still watch TV, so people still should advertise on TV. No one says all of it should move. But certainly over time, if you look at the percentages of time spent, more of it should be moving to digital, not just from TV, but from all forms of old media. What needs to happen are compelling ad products. People have to adapt to new ways of doing things and be able to measure results. And I'll give one example. So on Facebook, Certainly people watch 30 second TV ads with sound, but they also see ads in their newsfeed, which are video, which they'll watch for shorter without sound. Now we have some clients who just want us to be able to deliver 30 seconds with sound, and we work hard to do that for them, and if they can make compelling ads, people will watch them. We also have clients who will say, okay, I understand, I need to adapt. So we have one client uh, runs the largest uh, sports retailer in Canada. He said to his ad agency, I hear people are watching ads on Facebook video seven seconds without sound. Give me ads that sell my product in seven seconds without sound. And he did it, and he sold out his products. And we've studied with Nielsen that a lot of the value happens in the first three seconds. And so it is both taking the old formats and making them work in a new environment. It's also adapting to the format. The original TV ads were people standing at mic reading their radio ads. Some of the ads, as people move them from one format to the other, they don't actually adopt the format. And so it is on us. We tell our clients, we want to be the best dollar you spend. We want to be the best minute you spend. It is on us to help them find formats and the creative, the creative formats that make ads work on Facebook. And it's on anyone else who's selling ads in mobile or digital to make those ads work and to measure the results. It's a really important part of it. OK, we want to get to every question, so let's do it very quick. We only have another minute or two. Quick. All right, uh, Cheryl, you're getting all the Gawker questions. Owen Thomas, San Francisco Chronicle, former managing editor of Ballywag. When I was there, Gawker and Facebook actually had their first technology platform conversations. And um, a representative from Facebook platform actually asked our CTO to exclude Ballywag from Facebook Connect so you could not use your Facebook profile to leave comments. Can you comment on the decision to make that request of Gawker and why that actually did not ultimately happen. Yeah. I don't know who did that, and it wasn't a decision that came to me or Mark. So a lot of people work there. I don't believe we ever excluded anyone from, from the platform that I'm aware of. I don't believe in the end they were excluded. And certainly today, Gawker is active on our platform. And again, one of the small group of companies we invited into the beta. And that was before we knew about Peter Thiel. OK, thank you. Hi, uh, Casey Newton with The Verge. Um, at F8, Facebook unveiled a new bot platform with some fanfare. Um, I've tried a lot of these bots and have been somewhat underwhelmed by the experience. <laughs> it's either tedious tapping in uh, all of my requests or the AI maybe isn't quite where it should be. Uh, can you talk about the reception that you've seen with the bots that you've introduced so far and maybe how you're going to bring them along and improve that user experience? Yeah, and it's a great question. And it's pretty early for, for a lot of these things. And so we're working really closely with, with a lot of partners. And I think you know, what we see is, in a lot of the genesis is, you know, billion messages happening already a month between a person and a business you know, on Facebook. And so that's you know, a billion messages that a small business owner has to respond to it every month or the aggregate of them. And so the hope is if we can take some portion of those and turn them into, you know, are you open on Memorial Day? You know, is a very simple question that a bot ought to be able to answer. And so you know, starting to see some of these good experiences. And I think I'm really excited about bots in the long run. I think like many of these advanced technologies, people you know, assume it's all here today and there's a lot more you know, technology and work to be developed. So I think this will improve kind of month over month, year over year as, as these things go. Great. Jim, do you have a question? No. OK. All right. Thank you both very much. Yeah. We have a spotlight coming up next, something that Cheryl was talking about. It's worth staying. Thank you, too. Thank, thank you. you.